28, um, hacking mobile devices, and we're going to do the last uh, part of Android implementation issues today, and then a couple demos. I took a project down. There was one about Metasploit I left in. The second Metasploit project, I took it down because as far as I can tell, that tool has not been updated in many years, and it no longer works on modern applications. So it's not really worth learning how to do it that way. So let me get the uh, 8C. Uh, Metasploit. You can use Metasploit to make malware, uh, but you can't use it to attach malware to an existing APK anymore, as far as I can tell. When I try, that, that, that functionality seems to be so out of date that it doesn't work anymore. Does Cobalt uh, Strike give you any access news? It's a good question. Does Cobalt Strike provide it? And I don't know. I don't have access to Cobalt Strike. It would be nice if I did. Um, you didn't back them? What's that? You didn't back them? I didn't back them? Backing them. Packing them? Ask them for it. Ask, I don't know. I might. I, I don't know. I haven't. I haven't. I, don't, I can't imagine they'd let me have it and give it to my students, but... Uh, you just tell them you train your students to work with them. <laughs> maybe, but I mean, that means it's going to be up there for everybody to get a copy. I, I, that's why I don't see how it would work. I haven't, I haven't asked them. I should try sometime, I guess, yeah, but I... But I them, so yeah, but, but, I don't, but see, I don't think they'd let me do it because I want to put it on my website so everybody can get it. Them, yeah, a whole bunch of students walking out, out on the field up their cars. <laughs> yeah, maybe I could. I'd have to somehow... Yeah, I don't know. I haven't done that. Cobalt Strike would be interesting, though. You're right. Somebody here says, some of M520's figure pictures were placed on wrong places. Oh, okay. Well, let me make a note of that. I don't remember what 520 is, but I'll make a note on my notes page. M520 pictures are wrong. Okay. Um, M520 images in wrong place. All right. Thank you for telling me. I'll have to look into that. All right. So uh, let me just warn you in advance that quite a bit of the stuff in this chapter refers to that uh, Drozer tool, and uh, we're not using that, and I think it's also pretty badly out of date, so I'm going to kind of skim through the parts of this. But it does tell you something about what's going on inside Android. So, but I think this um, injecting exploits for JavaScript interfaces is probably not that important anymore. I think this is only for really old versions of Android and really old apps. So anyway, that's the one here. If an app loads content over HTTP, and it's running on a really old version of Android, then you can inject JavaScript code, and that, and as we talked about before, the JavaScript code in these old versions can actually execute Java and manipulate the platform. So that's pretty bad, but it only applies to really old apps. And there's a special module in Drozer to do this, which, like I said, we're not using anymore, but Drozer would let you make a sort of Metasploit agent and a Metasploit server to inject code this way. Um, so we're not going to do that, but it's, I don't think, it's another thing I think is just too out of date. Uh, another issue is some apps have their own update mechanism, and that's, of course, risky because their update might not be secure. For example, it might download via HTTP. Now, I don't know if anybody still downloads an update over HTTP. HTTP is very rare, but what a lot of them do is download by broken HTTPS, which amounts to not much better. Um, so they had a special Drozer tool to exploit that, too. Um, but we know how to do it by directly manipulating a smallie is one way to do it. And if they're going to do that, you could just put burp in the middle to inject code if they don't detect a, a, a broken HTTPS certificate. So Drozer, you make these agents and you'd inject code with a pwn um, uh, URL. Thing, the URL that starts in pwn would activate the Drozer. Now someone says Python 2's pip is still able to be installed. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, you can possibly make Drover run on Python 2. I just, it seemed to me like it was so out of date, it was not really worth struggling because it just hasn't been updated. Most of the attacks it's specialized for are not relevant, I think, anymore. That was my feeling. I'm waiting for a better tool to come out. And um, both Metasploit and Drozer do not seem to have kept up with the times on Android attacks. Um, there may be a newer attack tool. Um, I'm not, however, what I'm getting more into is just directly manipulating Android and using the native tools to just understand how it works and not rely on these tools. So here's an example of this sort of thing. Samsung's MDM client app had an intent filter here, and you see it listens for um, the schema, SMDM, and it has no permissions in it, like something we talked about last time. So anybody can send in a, uh, any URL starting with this, it will then execute it, and therefore you could just update it, and it turned out that the update just had the URL right there, so you could use the this the MDM is the mobile device management. This is what you put on phones to control it for the company, like a domain controller and a domain uh, domain joined machine. And it was insecure. You could push an update, and it would let you put in the URL any update you want to. You could uh, install anything that way. 
Quite a few of these uh, security products have this kind of defect. There are antivirus products that have been caught doing this too, running a service that will execute something as system that you can inject. So they actually make your machine less secure to have it in there. Um, and I remember there was one, a famous one with Sophos antivirus for the Mac that one of the Google engineers found out how to completely take over your Mac remotely through the antivirus, which is pretty rude. Um, so that's the thing. A lot of, a lot of, oh, kernel. what's that? It's kernel land. Uh, yeah, I think it was, I don't know if it was in kernel land, it was least administrator. Probably kernel land though. Yeah. yeah. And the, um, that's the problem. A lot of people, about five years ago, a lot of security people really started complaining about antivirus, saying the stuff is sloppily written and it introduces new vulnerabilities, but most of the time it's worth having anyway because it stops a bunch of attacks. But uh, it does have its own defects. So anyway, this is what you'd see. You'd see uh, an MDM client available and you're supposed to install it, and when you do, but it doesn't validate, validate that the uh, update is coming from their servers, which it should have. All right, so um, here's some ways to get malware onto the device. One is to trick people into clicking on a link with social engineering. And another, you can install an app with zero permissions and then elevate your permissions later. That's another way to do it in case you think anybody actually looks at that permission screen before clicking OK, which I think is probably not true. Most people just click OK to put in the app. Um, so drive-by downloads are things that automatically download when you visit a site. And uh, typically, now there are some, very occasionally there have been ones where you don't do anything and the app goes on your device. There was one like that for uh, Safari a few years ago with download files, but those are rare. Usually you have to agree to it, so you trick them into something, missing plugin, update required or something, and they click on it and then they agree to it. So um, now in Android, uh, by default, it usually has Play Protect on and it will only install sources from known sources, uh, apps from known sources like the Google Play Store, which is very common. And so you have to turn that off. There'll be a setting someplace to accept apps from unknown sources. And in Android 8 and later, it still has the same setting, but you have to specify which app you're going to allow to do that, like just the folder where you download things or other apps. So, but you still have a way to turn it on. But it's not something that's turned on by default on phones that come with the Google Play Store installed. So this, it's not going to be as easy as it used to be to trick people into installing apps from unknown sources. However, last week, Europe passed a privacy law that is going to ban walled gardens. They're going to ban limiting your phone to download apps only from a known store. Seeing that as like locking you in a walled garden to make a lot of money, which in the iOS case, it totally is. And it's still, they're still going through litigation to determine exactly who this applies to, but I think it's pretty obvious who it applies to. And that means they're going to make it so the European iPhones cannot force you to use only the Apple Store and probably not the Android phones either. And so that will increase the probability of you downloading counterfeit apps. So I think this is probably a poorly thought out policy that is gonna make things worse. But you know, this, this is their backlash against the tech dominance of things over there. Also, yeah. It may not be just for iOS, because a lot of China, China so a big high tech company, they all have a Play Store. What about, something about iOS, what was that? So some of the, in China, the, they yeah. All they all have their own store. Yeah. So it's yeah. IOS. Well, I yeah. I, all the high tech companies have their own Play Store. You say. Yeah. So, okay. I did not know they, that. They all have that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's a good idea for them to have their own closed wallet store. It makes it much more secure, but it also means you can charge a ruinous rate for all the pay apps, yeah, which so is what. Yes. The so right. So I mean, I think what they're thinking in the EU is they can save money by escaping Apple's thirty percent charge. Yeah. But of the course. but but the but you will do that at the cost of getting more malware on the, on the phone. And that's what Apple's defense is. They have to do this to prevent the malware from getting on the phone. And they're probably right. If you wanted to install from everywhere, you can. Yes, and it's like if you want to put a firewall on your iOS app, you, on your phone, you can't because it's not available. No firewall, no antivirus, no hacking. Twenty tools, nothing. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
determined yet, but they're coming. And another one similar is they want, if you have a recommendation engine, they want you to release how it works. So YouTube and TikTok will have to explain how it works because everybody over here and over there are very worried about this. The pressure to ban TikTok is growing here, especially since just a couple days ago, ByteDance admitted that in fact, all the data of who's watching on TikTok does in fact go to China and Chinese people can watch it, which they absolutely denied over here. But they admitted it's true in Europe, that European TikTok viewers, their data is in fact processed in China and anybody can see what they're doing. No, and but then, but then ByteDance also put on a, a, a condition that they, they, the employee that with the access, they, they have to like uh, get approval from the committee in, in the US before they get access. Okay, well, that's what they say. They say, that's what the NSA says too. They says that the employee that views it will get permission from a US, and, well, and it may, they we'll see if. They have to do something like that, so obviously they're gonna kick, get kicked out of the, the US market. Yeah, well, they're in danger of getting kicked out of the US market. Yeah. A lot of people want to kick them out now. Yeah. And the other thing I heard on, the, on, I think, NPR is that in China, the TikTok app they distribute is completely different. And if you're like under the age of 14, it just shows you like educational programming and it limits you to like uh, 20 minutes a day or something. It's totally different than the one here. Yeah, it's heavily censored because they are aware that it's unhealthy for like teenagers to spend all day watching. No, they, they also have to worry about getting kicked out of China. That's right, that's right. They also have to worry about getting kicked out of China, exactly. Yeah, so, so I mean, this is the problem with multinational. China has their own strict rules and we are trying to develop some rules but we're so busy fighting them on ourselves, we can't really make up our minds. But the Europeans are pretty united, and they're making rules. Yeah, they all does everything they own. <laughs> yeah, because they're not, their government is not currently in the chaos that ours is. <laughs> anyway. open source their, their like, recommendation algorithm? Or at least have some information about it. Maybe not completely open source the recommendation, but they want information about it. They want to know what's being recommended, which I think is probably because of YouTube. Because the all... Because, like, like, a week or two ago, my recommendation so I looked up what they use for the recommendations, and they have like a list of all the In YouTube? Things. Like, it was like, a, they have like some, they have some link. Oh, good. Website that says like, what you can do to help like change what videos get recommended. Oh, well oh, that's interesting. So you can adjust the YouTube recommendations. What's that? That's how, they, how YouTube kicked you out. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, that's another issue. YouTube <laughs> keeps picking me out as they try to censor things, but anyway. Um, I think is YouTube is the big issue because uh, over here there's a general belief that YouTube caused Donald Trump to get in and there, there's election disinformation and targeted ads and and where you, if you and the various various scientists have done things like this like they make a profile and they just say I'm like a Christian in like Kentucky and that's all they say and they just watch what YouTube recommends and within like a day it's recommending extreme QAnon conspiracy videos because that's what it's targeted for that audience. So people who like are normal get deflected off into this crazy stuff by their algorithm. And so the government would really like to understand what they're doing and control what they're doing to stop that. Yeah, in the video I saw, they were only showing what like videos you get recommended. You talked about ads, they didn't talk about that, so I guess that is also a big thing. Oh, to get better ads, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, the various ones off, but I mean to control the actual recommendations, that's the problem. And of course, it's run by an AI, and the AI just wants you to watch more videos and stay on longer. And they find that, of course, watching something crazy and exciting that will make you mad is what makes you stay on longer. <laughs> so they need to, the government's feeling like they need to step in. But the problem is, of course, that the Republicans want them to see more of that crazy stuff. The Democrats want them to see less of that crazy stuff, so no one can agree. So I don't think anything's going to be done over here. But in Europe, they seem more interested in making these decisions. It seems like, however, forcing them to tell you what they're doing would be the first step. That's like putting ingredients on the food. Even when you're not going to ban certain ingredients, at least people could know what's in there. <laughs> and maybe they could make more, um, better decisions. So anyway, um, if you, when, yeah. When, the, when you, um, in the Android, when you set up like uh, allow uh, other source for, yeah. for install, yeah. does it give you all the permission like uh, if you like install it, the app from Play Store or something? Well, I think that's the point. If you say install app from unknown sources in the settings, you can put them in from anywhere, and that's what we're doing in the project. You just give you all the all the all the privileges, you know, like uh, like read, write, and everything or something. You know, does it give? Well, I don't know. I don't know what it's doing inside the read, write, and privilege. I think it's just um, you it can't. Extra, in, in, extra privileges than the Play Store or compared to the Play Store. Uh, it's, a, it's a good question, technically. I don't know exactly what it does. It does give you the same permissions as the Play Store, but I think it has something called Play Protect, which limits you to only take things from the Play Store, and it turns that off. And you can turn it off with a command line, too. We did it last time. I know um, if you, if you know application from Play Store, they 
Like, uh, you know, give you all the privileges so everything works. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I don't think it's as simple as like a lack of execute permission, but there's some kind of permission it uses to block you from, so you can't just download an APK and run it on a default Android phone. You have to turn on unknown sources. However, if you want to sell a really cheap Android tablet or something, and you make it so cheap you violate Google's rules, you can't put the Play Store on it, and they sell them. The cheapest ones come without the Play Store on them because they don't meet their security rules, and then they connect you to these third-party things, and then they'll have things like USB debugging and installed from unknown sources turned on by default. So anyway, so if you want your app to have persistence, like you get malware on the phone and you want it to automatically boot every time they reboot the phone, then you could do this. This is the um, permission that will automatically start the app when the phone boots up but only on really old versions of Android. And by the way, this doesn't really make any sense for a phone. How often does anybody actually turn off their phone? That's not really the issue. Most people don't turn off their phone very often at all. What's much better is you just have like a web page with an iPame to launch the app. It would be probably more likely to work. Do, do apps, you know, somehow, like, um, you know, if you load up into a phone, somehow force the phone to, like, um, to limit the, you know, like, I haven't, like I haven't heard of that one. That's an interesting yeah, question. Saying, see one phone is like yeah. uh, the guy is downloading a bunch of YouTube, and somehow he got it down to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's an interesting question. So can an app load your phone from 5G to 4G? Certainly if you I root the phone. Like yeah, well, if you root the phone, you could go to a custom ROM and you could do anything. And so that would be effectively like a jailbreak or root attack. It's, that's far beyond what a normal app can do, I think. But it's not a bad idea. That would be an easy way to lower the encryption where you can just crack all the encrypted traffic. That's a common trick. But yeah, that's... I Also, that's what um, surveillance products do. Man-in-the-middle attacks like these stingrays that the cops put up and the criminals put up, they will make your phone attach and then they will tell you, I'm a really old cell phone tower, I can only speak 2G. And then your phone will speak 2G. It will downgrade to that because you might drive to some remote place where they have a really old tower so the and your phone... phone... What's that? So the phone may be hacked? No, the phone would not, that's not even hacked, that's normal. I've done that. If you ever drive to a remote place, your phone will downgrade 5G, 4G, 3G, 2G because it'll connect to any tower and if the tower is really old, it'll downgrade... It's not, it's not I know, but if, you, if, I, if I park a truck outside the building and I broadcast a 2G tower and the signal is stronger, your phone will connect to it and then downgrade to 2G. That's what the police do for wiretaps. So I mean, it, and it's the function acting as intended. You can do it if you put up a fake cell phone tower. Oh, so it's uh, based on a signal, signal strength? Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. As far as I know, it's just based on signal strength. Anyway, um, so... Uh, now, normally, you, newly installed apps cannot have this intent, um, so this is less common, but uh, anyway, for automatic launching. Now, in modern Android, it won't download an APK automatically, so you have to trick the user into doing it with social engineering. Um, they have to click something to launch it. So you have to put something on the screen and convince them they have to click this button for some reason, which, as you know, is pretty easy, but, you know, this is like most phishing. Technically, you did something wrong. You clicked on a link, you downloaded something, you ran an attachment, it's not all that hard to trick people into doing that, but it is not as cool as being able to do it with no clicks at all. Which actually takes me to something. I might as well put here. A student asked if I was going to cover Pegasus. And I said, well, I don't have that much to say about it, but we might as well talk about Pegasus. I got some news articles about it here. Um, and it's worth mentioning. Um, there we are. Here's a detailed technical analysis which is very detailed and far too detailed. I found it sort of mind-boggling. It goes through, it gives its molly code for everything it does. But um, the point is, Pegasus can do all this stuff. And Pegasus is considered the most powerful malware ever made for Android. And this is what I think, um, oh, this garbage. All right, let me defeat the stupid paywall. Um, all right. Uh, all right, so Pegasus, um, is just malware that lets you do anything you want on the phone, take the photographs, turn on the microphone, take all the messages and everything, and you put it on with zero click install. The early versions, they had to send you an SMS, and the modern versions, they don't even have to send you an SMS. They can just, I think they send you an SMS, but you don't even have to open it to read it. So, um, and there, I remember this is supposedly happened to Jeff Bezos, you know, the head of, of uh, Amazon. He got an SMS from the king of, Prince of Saudi Arabia, and then 
After that, his phone started acting funny, and then his secrets about his love life started getting published in the tabloids and stuff. And he said they were stealing his naked pictures and messages to his mistresses and stuff on the phone, which is probably all true, because I think this was also used by the, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia to track Kamal Jalal Khashoggi so they could kill him. So they totally use it, and, and despots all over the world buy this thing so from... Is, is, is this thing you know, is a picture or uh, it's not text, right? Um, I th it's not entirely clear. There are various versions, and I think they said the later version, um, they don't, they don't, uh, they have spear phishing and they have zero click attacks where you don't have to click anything. And when they fail, then they can put it over wireless transceiver located near the target or simply manually installed if they can borrow your phone. They have various ways to put it on. But the scariest one is, of course, the zero click. They can just put it on your phone remotely without you doing anything. Did they say anything about that? No, I didn't say anything about it. I don't think they say what the SMS looks like. So I don't think there's any way you can tell. But the point is it's expensive and it's only used against high value targets. Yeah. Where do you get this, where do you get this article? It's from The Guardian. Um, and I can put it in the chat. This is from about a year ago, but this is probably the most informative one, easy to understand. Do you have a some hack that, some key hack or something? What's that? In the previous article, is from the key, uh, hack key or something? This article here, yeah, this is, this is Cyber Geeks. And this is three whole articles here, and this is extremely detailed with a mind-boggling number of uh, details of exactly how every one of these attacks work. Now I'm showing you the Smalley code for every single attack and what the signals are on the server and everything. So it might be fun to make like a, uh, um, a project where we play with this, but I couldn't find a, a sample to download. And I don't know if it'd run on an emulator. These things usually take, usually for malicious things like this, you have to have a real phone. But anyway, as you can see, let's, we should be able to play this up to right see it. So it gets everything, right? Your call logs, your messages, your Gmail, your contacts, your browser history, you know, just everything. And it shows on your phone without you doing anything. So that's a thing to be aware of. Anything you put on your phone, if somebody powerful and rich wants to get you, they can get you, in case you had any illusions. I mean, I thought everybody knew this. Every computer, every computer device can be hacked by powerful adversaries like the NSA and the KGB, and Israeli military, they've got stuff that will just blast through every defense you can buy and get on there and record everything, and there's not anything you can do. I mean, I met a guy that was, said he left Russia, and his friends back in the KGB keep hacking his stuff, and he said, what can I do? And I said, there's nothing you can do. They, it's just like if they wanted to kill you on the street, there's nothing you could do that would stop them. I mean... Go off-grid. Yeah, that's the thing. I said, if you got an Android CD and you booted from the CD, or a Ubuntu CD, and you ran the live system and never logged into anything, then you could use a computer, but as soon as you log into like email or something, they'll know who you are and you're host again. I mean, yeah, going off grid is what you'd have to do. <laughs> Basically, you can't use the, the the internet anymore without these powerful adversaries knowing everything you do. How much does something like this cost for these big corporations? It's a good question. How much does it cost? And I don't think anybody knows. I mean, we wouldn't know about it except for these privacy groups, but because they use it against um, they use it against political activists and journalists. And eventually they used it into Canadian journalists and some of these privacy groups like Amnesty International analyzed the journalist's phone and found it. So that's how they got caught. But it's, you know, these things are not for sale in an open market. They sell to governments and I'm sure they pay vast amounts. It's not like there's a buying page or the price. You just negotiate. And when the EU got mad, it's because it got into the EU politicians. <laughs> yeah, and, and the NSA hacked Angela Merkel's phone. She was pretty mad at us for that. So I mean, Governments and military can totally do this, and uh, if they don't develop it themselves, they can buy it. Now, someone's asking, how does it get on? Well, I, I don't think it's entirely clear how it gets on without any click. I think it comes from an SMS message. Uh, this one here is the more intelligible article, and um, the earliest version gets on through spear phishing, where you have to click on a link. But then they improved it, and now they have a zero-click attack which requires no interaction. So it comes on with a zero-day vulnerability. And, and, one, and one time somebody yeah. recommended people uh, with the phone to turn off the, the SMS messages, the, the media, just turn off the auto load. Yeah, that's turn off the SMS. That's not a bad idea. That might help. Turn off the auto load. Auto, you, yeah, auto load, okay. With, with some, some we'll, we'll play the videos. 
Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, because the, the auto load where it'll automatically play a video. That that yeah, that, that sounds risky. I would not expect that to really stop this, but that might stop some versions of it. Yeah, that would that would certainly be the first place I would try is um uh, a PDF reader or a video player, anything that takes a big complicated file like that is likely to have a bug. And you can make a malicious file that will exploit it. That's why a whole lot of PDF attacks work on. So that would be a good place. Yeah, it would probably make your phone a little safer. But the fact is, um, you know, it's really hard to believe that your phone is safe. If these if your adversaries are like this, you have a problem. I remember Nicole Perloth wrote about this. I mean, she was the cybersecurity reporter for the New York Times for 10 years. And she had a lot of inside military sources. And she said she would just talk to people on the phone and sort of in code, arranged to go meet them in a restaurant, and she would have no phone, no computer, no nothing, just have a, a pallet and piece of paper to write down stuff. That's what you do. That's the only realistic way. There's no way you could have, if you're dealing with that kind of high powerful people, there's no way any computer device could be trusted near them. That's the only reasonable thing to do. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you meet them face to face <laughs> in some place that's hard to find with no gadgets at all. Because, yeah, that's what happens with the SCIFs. The SCIFs, the Sensitive Compartment and Information Facilities, you have to not take in your phone, no nothing. That's why when the, um, when the Republicans invaded the SCIF sometime earlier in the Biden administration to complain about what he was doing in there, they mole marched in with their phones and everything, violating the security of the SCIF, and that was a major flaw, a major breach of protocol. Um, Yes, yeah, so I see people say the Mexican cartel is actually to Pegasus. Well, I imagine. I think anybody, that's the problem. The, the Israelis will just sell to anybody with money. The NSO group did. I think they finally got disbanded. We're selling to all these rotten people. And they claim they'd only sell like NATO members, but they would just sell to anybody that paid them. And they got caught. And so they like dissolved the company, reformed another company with a different name, and they're doing it again, you know. Just, but, you know, that's the thing. They're basically like arms dealers, like people selling missiles. Then, and, they can get more money by selling to the bad guys, and so every company has to decide whether they're willing to do that. Yeah. Does Android or well, I guess Google like do anything about these kind of things? Like, well, they when they find the flaws, they fix them, but they can never keep up. Okay. So companies like Celebrite and Elcomsoft will hack into any phone for you anytime if you're a government. They, they they have researchers that just stay on top of it. They get ahead of the company. That's why you know uh, my my student who found the new iOS jailbreak. They offered him jobs at Apple. You know, he, did, he didn't want to take them, because if you do that, then you can never publish any of your research anymore. Of course, everything's kept secret in Apple. That's another way to go. The same thing if you join the NSA. You can hack them there, but then everything's secret again. And if you want to like publish your stuff, you have to be unaffiliated. But the fact is, you know, no matter how much they fix it, there's a bunch of other holes, and some people can find them, and they sell for high values on the sort of gray and black and market, and you can also sell them legally through exploit voters to the NSA. They'll buy your exploits. And then they won't tell the phone, so it gets patched so they can keep using them. And then it leads to disasters like WannaCry, which was an NSA exploit that they sloppily lost, that went to Russia, and Russia made a release it so a worm could be used to infect all the machines with the NSA's hacking tools. And that was a big scandal for them. And so a lot of people say the NSA shouldn't be finding exploits and hiding them. They should be telling the manufacturers so they can patch them. But they don't have an incentive to do that. They want to keep their weapons working. <laughs> So, you know, that's the way it is. If anybody thinks your phone is secure, you need to get over that. You, the point is, this is true of your real life, though. If you walk down the street, some guy with a gun could kill you, right? And even if you have a bodyguard and body armor, if the military wanted to kill you, you're toast. There's nothing you could buy, nothing you could do. You just have to make threat modeling. How much does somebody want to kill you? And how much does somebody want to hack your phone? If you put on, like, normal antivirus, that will stop ordinary criminals. As long as you're not a high-value target, that might be good enough. But... Yeah, people people freak out. People think they people think they want to be super safe, and there is no super safety. You know, it's not protecting yourself from military and government, and like the Mexican cartels. Yeah. Yeah. If you you can you know, if you go off the grid, but if the if the yeah, try just what I was thinking, Osama bin Laden. I mean, if they really want you, even going off the grid won't save you. They will find you anyway, but it makes it harder. What's that? They did it in Breaking Bad. You got away. Actually, not really. Well, I'm, and, and, but in Breaking Bad, I mean, I'd only watched some of the Breaking Bad. But the point is, all he did was sell drugs, right? It's not, it's not true, right? <laughs> yeah, but, but, even, but I mean, all he did was sell some drugs. He wasn't like Osama bin Laden. That's they didn't true. really want him. I mean, that's threat modeling again, right? If all you've done is sell some drugs, then there's like the FBI and stuff after you, but they don't really going to have, they don't want you like they want bin Laden. <laughs> Yeah, that's the other way. All right. So, how do they clone your phone to get calls redirected without a SIM card? Um, that 
is the SIM swapping is real powerful, and I think that one works by social engineering the phone company. They call the phone company help desk and say, I lost my phone. I need you to move my number to this other phone. That's my understanding of how it works. But um, I'm not an expert, and it would be good to read up on it. The SIM swapping is a real popular attack. And the point of it is it defeats two-factor authentication. Now they can read your SMS messages, which is why many people are really getting tired of SMS-based two-factor authentication. They're saying that is really lame. You need to use app-based two-factor, where it's an authenticator app, because that they wouldn't get when they, um, when they clone your phone. They wouldn't get it by putting malware in your phone that easily either. So anyway, these are very good issues. Anyway, I wanted to bring that up because it's coming up here. So your app might have no permissions to ask for, and then you can find vulnerabilities to install additional packages, and there are various ways to do it. There are kernel exploits that have been found that let you add permissions when you shouldn't. And there was a command injection. This was in Samsung. They had a service listening that would um, record this, that would take the logs and save it in a file. But the file name was under the control of the user. So this is a classic command injection vulnerability. So all they had to do was send an intent that included a file name that had a dummy file name and then a semicolon, and then you could have a command that does something else here. And that all executes with system privileges. So this is a fairly common type of exploit. They're learning something that uses untrust user input to make a command line, and it's running a system privileges, so you can inject code. And uh, you run ADB, you only have access to the sort of phone or anything, right? Well, yes, but another app could send this broadcast. You wouldn't need to, yes, you don't, that's right. But this ADB doesn't have root privileges. And this runs a system privilege, so it's a privilege escalation. Good. All right, anyway, and here's another one. You could escalate privileges on Android because um, the input stream did not check that the object being deserialized was actually serializable. There's a whole bunch of these serialization exploits. So like I was saying, the ones that play movies and open PDF files, there tend to be flaws, and things that open compressed data in general tend to have flaws. And serialized data is a stream of data, Java serialization is the most common one, that packs it into a, a object which has to be unpacked, and again, it's complicated, and there are a bunch of flaws in the unpacking process that can be exploited. So uh, Jeff Forrestal found this one. This guy is Rainforest Puppy. He's the guy that discovered SQL injection. SQL injection was discovered by him in 98, and it's world famous now. It was responsible for the largest number of stolen data ever until about two years ago when Amazon S3 buckets managed to exceed it as an even faster way to lose all your data. Um, but I mean, it was enormous. And he also found the fake ID volume, which is uh, this one here. The fake ID phone, which by the way, the same thing was true of Internet Explorer version 3. It didn't verify the certificate authority. So what this one did is to tell if you were running at Apple, it would just check to see if the issuer field was Adobe, and then it would let you run with system privileges. It didn't actually check to make sure that it was really signed by Adobe. So all you had to do is make a fake certificate with the name Adobe, and it would believe that, <laughs> which is what well, I, Internet Explorer version 2 or 3, you have a chain of signatures. There's the app. There's your, your code signed by something, and that's signed by somebody else, and that's signed by root, and it didn't bother to go back more than one step. So you could sign it by your own CA, which was not, in fact, signed by a real CA, and it would not go any further and notice that, so you could fool it. So anyway, that's the game here, and therefore you could uh, get privileges that you shouldn't have by tricking it into thinking you're an official Adobe product. All right, and so if you want to get um, the app's data, then Drozer could do this. We're not bothering Drozer, but as we now know, um, that Pegasus can totally do it. Turn on the microphone, read your SMS, read your contacts, your location, screenshot, you know, everything. Um, all right, now SE Linux is a security enhanced Linux. It's developed to meet military specs, and this limits what apps can do. It has something called app armor in it that limits what each app, folders each app can go to and things like that. And you can, of course, turn it off. Just like we turned off Play Protect with the command last time, you can turn off the enforcing mode of SE Linux if it's turned on on your Android. I don't know how many Androids really have SE Linux turned on, but of course, with root access, you can turn it off. And uh, then, of course, if you can record video, then you can record a unlock pattern. I don't know if people are still using these. There was a time when people used this pattern with their fingers instead of their face or something. I don't know if this is common anymore. I think now it's pretty... Still use it. I see people still using it. Yeah, well, then, then you record a video to defeat it. That's one way to defeat it. Um, all right, and you can, of course, uh, back in the early various days, every app had access to the SD card. And by the way, every app had access to the logs back then too. So people put things on the SD card. This was a black eye for um, the vulnerability scanner, the most famous open source vulnerability scanner. Um, the name I can't remember right now, the one everybody uses. Um, 
I'll Google it. Open source. Nessus. Nessus made an Android app to control their vulnerability scanner, and they stored your credentials unencrypted on the SD card. So it was bloody awesome. They're like the one of the famous security companies in the world, leader, and they made a mistake like that. And that's been gone for years. They brought it up and they got humiliated like crazy. Your password was just sitting right on the SD card. But, and anybody can see it. But anyway, things like that happen. Um, now, you have to have a permission to read the stuff on the SD card. And if you want to get the Wi-Fi keys, then you can dump them out too. All the Wi-Fi keys are stored on here. Same thing's true of Mac OS too. The Wi-Fi keys are just right there. You can go in the keychain and get them. Um, when I forget the Wi-Fi key, I can just go in there and find it. Um, and now we know you just go right in the password manager too. Um, anyway, uh, Gmail tokens, remember you have to sign in with, with Google when you first turn on your Android phone. They want you to sign in with Google. You need to get it in the Play Store and all kinds of things. So it doesn't store that password on the phone. What it stores is like a cookie. It stores a token, which is not reducible to your password for what that's worth, but it is what it stores to authenticate you. So I guess stealing this would be enough to get some kind of session into your account. I'm not quite sure how much, but you can find it. It's stored, uh, it's available in this account CE uh, database. And you do have to be root to read it, of course. Uh, so third-party apps have account have databases, SQLite files, and they may very well store plain text passwords in there. They often store it in various files. Um, so that's one place you might find it, for example, email clients if they're using the old protocols. What they ought to do is store something like a cookie there, but they might just store a plain text password there or something like a hashed or encrypted password. And then here's the gesture file is what um, records the gesture to log in. Here's the password. And you can crack these. I wrote a Python at one time. Of course, it's not that hard to crack. The passwords are just hashed with a standard hashing routine. And if you have a four-digit pin, there's only 10,000 options. So you can just write a Python program and try all 10,000 until you find the one that matches. So if you get this file, you can reverse it to get the pin. And there's an online tool you can use to uh, unpack the gesture key and find out what the pattern lock is. Now, if you have fingerprint recognition or face recognition, they somehow reduce your face or your fingerprint down to a certain number of numbers and store it. And what they say is it's not a complete photograph of you or your finger, so there's no way to turn it back into the photograph. And I've never seen anybody do that. So apparently that's true. So that might be some reassurance. So um, if an app has context, which means you know, it acts like a logged-in user can read the clipboards, and I tried to read the clipboard on my emulator, but I can't get into the clip. It's actually very hard to read the clipboard now. It used to be pretty easy, and easy on some models of phones, but now they've made it very difficult, apparently intentionally. So you can't just steal stuff out of the clipboard, because I wanted to see if the password manager is putting stuff in the clipboard, and I could not find any reasonable way to do it. There are some special apps to read the clipboard, but they say they all quit working around Android 10. So I think Android is on to this, and uh, it's real hard to read the clipboard. Um, the Samsung, though, if I had a Samsung phone, apparently, at least at one time, it stored it in data clipboard, and you can just find it there. But um, anyway, I, I would like to make an app, a, a project where you steal data from the clipboard, but I haven't found an easy way to do it on a modern version of Android, like Android 11. And of course, you can send keyboard presses and such with the input command. You can just ADB. You can send commands just like you were tapping on the screen. So you can, for example, force a tap. Um, if you dump this window, you can get the screen dimensions down here. So now you know how many pixels wide and high the screen is, and then you can figure out how to load something by counting the pixels. And you know, so you can you can figure out that something you want to launch is at 800, 975, and tap it. You know, that's uh, it. Probably would be important to have like malware that lets you take a screen image, a photograph, and examine it to do that. But you could, in principle, simulate taps on the screen with a with Android AM. All right, and uh, of course, you can just back things up. Gets all user and app data, and anything that's allowed to be backed up, you can back it up. And so that's probably a pretty good way to steal personal data from the phone. Um, it would be interesting to see. I don't think this stuff is encrypted with anything you don't have. It'd be interesting to see. I haven't played with it enough to see. And this is, uh, by the way, the other thing, which I know for iPhones, this is why all the privacy stuff is pretty much just nonsense, because they won't unlock a locked iPhone. Apple will not do it and they can't do it, but everything in iCloud is available to them. They need that because they need to put, if you lose your phone and you try to load your data from iCloud, they need to be able to get it. So, and the government can just subpoena that. So the fact that they can't get on your phone is in fact of almost no importance because everybody puts their stuff in iCloud. 
and the government can get at that. So if you're a terrorist, you need to stop using iCloud and then get an iPhone, and then in fact they really can't get in without paying Celebrite a pile of money. But Celebrite can get in. So, you know, they'll, you have to, like I say, it's all threat modeling. If it's the FBI or the CIA that wants in, they're getting in. You don't fool yourself. <laughs> but if it's just, you know, ordinary crooks trying to get in, you can stop them. <laughs> anyway, um, all right, so let's take a look at a Kahoot. Oh, I'm not aware of a, you say there's a company in Australia that can hack into an iPhone. I know Celebrite can do it. I'm not aware of an Australian remember, company. Remember one time the FBI put out like a one million bucks to get into the iPhone? What was that? The one time the FBI put out a uh, one million bounty. They did. They did. And I, I that, thought... That time was, was hacked by, a, by the company in Australia. Oh, oh I didn't know that. I thought it was Celebrite. Celebrite. I, I heard some people say it was Celebrite. Other people said it wasn't. No, Maybe. It's not, it's not well, if it's an Australian it's actually, company, I'd like to... L3, L3? Defense, defense company, and then that company bought a uh, company, uh, security company out in Australia. L3 Harris. Yeah, it's, it's a defense company. And these are the ones that hacked the iPhone? No, that company bought a uh, small company out in Australia. Oh, they bought the company. In Australia, they, they found a previous uh, former employee that had Apple stuff. Oh. And get that guy to, to work on the, the, the phone and then get it, get it to, to collect the money. Well, that's interesting. Okay, I never heard the story. The FBI wanted to uh, unlock it. A small Australian hacking firm. Well, good. That's the yeah. link. Good, I'll save this. Yes, that's, the guy I... hacked it was uh, David Wang. David Wang something out in Australia. Okay, I'm glad and you told Apple, me. And then Apple is suing that guy because that guy keep on hacking Apple stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, well, so that guy's known. No, I'm glad you told me because I heard some people say it was Celebrite and other people said it wasn't Celebrite and it never was clear to me how it turned out. But this is a, that's interesting information. So it was the azimuth that unlocked the thing. That is actually, I want to read that later. Yeah, that's why I saved it on my news links. Okay. And I'm going to put it on Twitter and I put it in the chat too. So that, that is an interesting one, yeah. So uh, that's two years ago. But I mean, there was a big argument. The FBI, of course, didn't want to say who did it. So it took a while before it leaked out. Yeah. Yeah, you leave out in uh, some of those uh, technical websites. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you know, because I heard some people at the time say, no, it wasn't Celebrite, but, oh. but everybody said it was Celebrite, and that's the only, and I met the guy at Celebrite, so I knew they could do it, but, I mean, it wasn't them. Apple that's, will know. Apple is suing those guys. Apple yeah. Apple. Well, of course, that's another thing. Apple will sue you when you're in that business. Yeah. That business is kind of illegal. I mean, reverse engineering Apple stuff, uh, they don't like that, of course. <laughs> They see you and they try to patch their stuff, so you're trying to stay ahead of them. Anyway, good. So it's CNET 128, Cahoots. L3 Harris make the stingray, somebody said. That's interesting. It would yeah, seem like a similar activity. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, makes sense. It's like I say, these are the modern weapons contractors selling cyber weapons. Yeah, we were going to make a Stingray here in class. We actually got a grant. We got some of the equipment. We didn't get all the right equipment, though. We weren't ready. Didn't get what we needed to do it. A Stingray is the fake cell phone tower that puts out the signals to trick your phone into connecting, and then they can run. What's that? That's right. That's what they call them, Stingrays. That's the brand name. That's what the cops use. And you can make your own. You can buy the equipment. The problem is it's highly illegal to run it. I had a plan. There's a room here that's basically a Faraday cage. So we could take cell phones in that room and play with it without actually hijacking people's real phone calls and going to prison. But we didn't get the, we didn't get all, well, it cost a couple thousand bucks to get the components and we didn't get them all. There's some important component missing so we weren't able to set it up. But, um, I can't hear you. Oh, it is, it is. Yeah, uh, if you go to DEF CON, I took a wireless hacking course where you can actually pick up phone calls with just a $30 USB dongle. But um, he points out it's highly illegal. So um, I said, well, I can't really give this as homework to my students. He said, no, oh, you can't. Well, yeah, the fun stuff tends to be illegal, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, but even saying for that problem, wiretap laws are really strict. Messing with the telephone network is really not a good idea. Oh, and here's an article about the Stingray somebody posted. Maybe this might be worth. Yeah, here's an example of Stingray. I'll throw it in the news. There's a good picture of the Stingray, ground-based vehicle, vehicle and stuff. I'll throw it in the news if you want to see that. Yeah, that's the Stingray is a commercial product. Yeah, and you can make your own. There are hacking instructions. The problem is it's super illegal to use it, but you can make it. <laughs> Anyway, um, I should have this thing running somewhere. Yep, let's see, wait a minute now. Uh, here we are, yeah, I finally made it to the game. All right, let's try this. A lot of good discussion tonight. Okay, so what can you load safely over HTTP? And that's what everybody knows now. And there was a time when they thought it's okay as long as you're not sending passwords, but the point is if you're loading anything, you can inject script into there. And so you're basically giving control of the uh, phone, of the browser to the server. So, no matter what you've done for. Yeah, that's why everybody has pretty much abandoned HTTP. They just realized it's just a bad idea. Everything should just be HTTPS. All right. All right, so how did the, Escalate privileges in Android 4.4. Wow, somebody said the string ray cost $134,000. That's rude. Well, you can make your own for about $2,000, apparently. Anyway. Um, What's that? Yeah. Then you can pocket the difference. That's right. Well, I think the one you make yourself isn't as powerful. No, yeah, but yeah. So anyway, object input stream, you that's... Just, you just downgrade it into like a couple of feet and then just make it, easy, make it legal. Yes, it yes. It doesn't need to be as good. So. <laughs> There's a bunch of these. There were a bunch of... You ancient... to for TSMC. This that's right. Why, why, why yeah, you could make your own company. Yeah, anyway. All right. Um. The song, the song you downgrade is legal. <laughs> I bet it would be hard to get a license or whatever you need to do it, but anyway. Uh, no, but there's short distance. You don't need license, right? I guess. So which file might have your passwords from your email clients? I don't know. I bet there would be legal problems, but I'm only guessing. I'd definitely talk to a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. All right, and that's accounts.db. All right. Oh, good. All right. And... Uh, so which, how do you simulate user screen taps? <laughs> yeah, that's the input command, of course. All right. So. All right. Thank you.